It's kind of interesting. I mean, when I look at a new kind of science, you're now living inside the history, so you can't tell the story of these decades, but it seems like the new kind of science has not had the revolutionary impact I would think it uh, might. Like, it feels like at some point, of course it might be, but it feels at some point people will return to that book and say that was something special here. This was well, incredible. Look, what, so, what happened? Or do you the, think that's already happened? Oh, yeah, it's happened, except that people aren't, you know, the, the sort of the heroism of it may not be there. But the, what's happened is for 300 years, people basically said, if you want to make a model of things in the world, mathematical equations are the best place to go. Last 15 years, doesn't happen. You know, new models that get made of things most often are made with programs, not with equations. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, was that sort of going to happen anyway? Was that a consequence of, you know, my particular work and my particular book? It's hard to know for sure. I mean, I am always amazed at the amount of feedback that I get from people where they say, oh, by the way, you know, I started doing this whole line of research because I read your book, blah, 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 blah. It's like, well, can you tell that from the academic literature? You know, were there, was there a chain of, you know, academic references? Probably not. One of the interesting side effects of publishing in the way you did this tome is it serves as an education tool and an inspiration to hundreds of thousands, millions of people. But because it's not a single, it's not a chain of papers with piffy titles, it doesn't create a splash of citations. Like no, it's had it's had plenty of citations, but it's it's you know I think that the it people think of it as probably more you know conceptual inspiration than uh, than kind of a you know this is a line from here to here to here in our particular field. Right. I think that the you know the thing which I am disappointed by and which will eventually happen is this kind of study of the this sort of pure computationalism, this kind of study of the abstract behavior of the computational universe, that should be a big thing that lots of people do. You it's mean a, in mathematics purely, almost like- It's like itself. pure mathematics, but it isn't mathematics. But it isn't, it, it isn't. It's, it's a new kind of mathematics. It's, it's a, <laughs> a new title kind of the book. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a good that's title. why the book is called that, <laughs> right? That's, that's not coincidental. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that, I haven't seen really rigorous investigation by thousands of people of this idea. I mean, you look at your competition around Rule 30. I mean, that's fascinating. If you, if you can say something, right? is there some aspect of this thing that could be predicted? That's the right. fundamental question of science. That's at the well, core. Well, that has been a question of science. I think that's a, that is a, some people's view of what science is about. And it's not clear that's the right view. In fact, as we as we live through this pandemic full of predictions and so on, it's an interesting moment to be pondering what, what science's actual role in those kinds of things is. Oh, you think it's possible that in science, clean, beautiful, simple prediction may not even be possible in real systems? That's the open right. question. Right, I don't think I don't... it's open. I think that question is answered and the answer is no. <laughs> well, mean, no, no. The... the answer could be just humans are not smart enough yet. Like we don't have um, no, the tools no, yet. No, that's, that's the whole point. I mean, that's that's sort of the big discovery of this principle of computational equivalence of mine. And um, the uh, you know this is something which is kind of a follow-on to Gödel's theorem, to Turing's work on the halting problem, all these kinds of things, that there is this fundamental limitation built into science, this idea of computational irreducibility that says that you know even though you may know the rules by which something operates, that does not mean that you can... Uh, readily sort of be smarter than it and jump ahead and figure out what it's going to do. The yes, but do you think there's a hope for pockets of computational reducibility, computational re oh, reducibility? reducibility. Yeah. Yes, like that's yes. So and then and then a set of tools in mathematics that help you discover such pockets. That's I mean, where we live is in the pockets of reducibility. Right. That's why, you know, and this is one of the things that sort of come out of this physics project and actually something that, again, I should have realized many years ago, but didn't, um, is, uh, you know, the, it, it could very well be that everything about the world is computationally irreducible and completely unpredictable. But, you know, in our experience of the world, there is at least some amount of prediction we can make. 
And that's because we have sort of chosen a slice of, um, probably talk about this in, in much more detail, but I mean, we've kind of chosen a slice of how to think about the universe in which we can kind of sample a certain amount of computational reducibility. And that's, that's sort of where we, where we exist. Um, and uh, it may not be the whole story of how the universe is, but it is the part of the universe that we care about and we sort of operate in. And um, that's, you know, in science, that's been sort of a very special case of that. That is, science has chosen to talk a lot about places where there is this computational reducibility that it can find. You know, the motion of the planets can be more or less predicted. You know, the, uh, uh, something about the weather is much harder to predict. Something about uh, you know other kinds of things the the um, are much harder to predict and it, it's um, uh, these are but science has tended to you know concentrate itself on places where its methods have allowed successful prediction. So you think Rule Thirty, if I could linger on it, because it's just such a beautiful, simple formulation of the essential concept underlying all the things we're talking about. Do you think there's pockets of reducibility inside Rule Thirty? Yes. But it's a question of how big are they, what will they allow you to say, and so on. And that's and figuring out where those pockets are. I mean, in a sense, that's the that's sort of a uh, uh, you know that is an essential thing that one would like to do in science. Um, but it's it's also the, the the important thing to realize that that has not been, you know, is is that science. If you just pick an arbitrary thing, you say, what's the answer to this question? That question may not be one that has a computationally reducible answer. That question, if you if you choose, you know, if, if you walk along the series of questions and you've got one that's reducible and you get to another one that's nearby and it's reducible too, if you stick to that kind of stick to the land, so to speak, yeah. then you can go down this chain of sort of reducible, answerable things. But if you just say, I'm just pick a question at random, I'm gonna have my computer pick a question at random. Yeah, uh, most likely know, it's going to be irreducible. Most likely it will be irreducible. And and what we're throwing in the world, so to speak, uh, we you know when we engineer things, we tend to engineer things to sort of keep in the zone of reducibility. When we're throwing things by the natural world, for example, not not at all certain that we will be kept in this kind of zone of reducibility. 